A good Sunday morning to you. This is Pastor Jones here at Valley Assembly of God, Hagerstown, Maryland, welcoming you to our morning worship time. And of course, you're getting the preaching of the word, and it's our prayer that uh, God will touch you and challenge you and, and really bring the needed help that you need today from his hands. Sometimes, humanly speaking, we offer little to no help to people, but Jesus always has what we have need of. And we're glad you've joined with us today. We're going to be in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John in just a moment. If you want to get your Bible turned to that 11th chapter, we're going to read a number of verses to lay the groundwork this morning as we talk about lessons from Lazarus. And uh, I, I pray and believe this is going to really challenge you today. While you're turning, let me just remind you, we're here every Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, for Bible study at 9 o'clock. 10 o'clock is morning worship with Children's Church going on. 6 o'clock is our Sunday evening service. Bro Rangers and Girls Ministries are going on at the same time. Monday, prayer meeting. And I know prayer meeting is not top on most people's list today, but let me tell you something. Prayer moves the hand of God. I hope you join us soon at 12 noon on Mondays. Wednesday is our midweek oasis service. We're involved in an in-depth Bible study in the parables of Christ. The youth group meets, children's ministries meet, and we hope you join with us every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. You say, you have all your services going? Yes, we do. And um, we're, we are seeing slowly but surely the returning of God's people back to the house of God. Uh, it can't happen too quick from my perspective, obviously. But I'm thankful for those that have returned. And I'm thankful for the faithful giving of every one of our families that have made our continuance possible and have blessed our efforts. And also, I want to thank all of those of you. I think we've got 173 subscribers right now, which, you know, that's 173 families or individuals, which, you know, is an enormous amount of people. And many of them view every week, whether they're here or not. And uh, it's our delight to be a blessing and a help to you. Let me begin to read as I'm going to skip through and read various verses to lay the groundwork for the message this morning. The very first verse, the Bible said, Now a certain man was sick whose name was Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. 11th verse. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. 14th verse of scripture. Then said Jesus unto them, Lazarus is dead. Look with me in that 19th verse of scripture. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou will ask of God, God will give it thee. And Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, because thou because shall believe in me shall never die. Believest thou this, Jesus said. And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into this world. Jump on me to that 30 verse verse. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And he said unto him, Lord, come and see. That 35th verse, shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. 37th verse, 
And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? 39. Then said Jesus, Take ye away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead for four days. And Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe that thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead were laid. And Jesus filled up their eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it that they might believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God open before us this morning. And thank you, God, for all these truths that are packed into these scriptures of which we've read this morning. I pray, anoint your word, anoint your messenger, God, and speak to every one of our hearts now, we pray. And God, we just give you the glory, praise, and honor for it, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. We have a sick man here in the scriptures by the name of Lazarus, whose sisters are Mary and Martha. You know them. Mary is the one who anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her own hair. Martha, you remember, was one that uh, prepared a meal and, and became encumbered in the kitchen. There's a friendship here beyond a mere passing. It's a picture of the master with those and whom he loves a joined together in a time of need. The first thing that I want you to see here this morning is that a message was sent to Jesus from the sisters informing Jesus of their brother's illness. Now, obviously, it was more than uh, just a passing illness. It was that of a serious nature. They were concerned. They were anxious. He's the one you love. They proclaimed to Jesus. His illness is serious. And it motivated their call for, for Jesus to come and, and undertake in this time of need. You've been there. I've been there. Have you ever fallen down before God uncontrollably weeping before God? Soliciting an answer. Soliciting a healing touch, a saving touch. That's where these women were. We see his sickness is not unto death, but to the glory of God. It wasn't a lack of love that caused Jesus to wait for two days. There was a plan. There was a purpose. There always is in the uh, parameters of God's workings in this world. And it's always for our good, our growth. And it hopes also that it would impact others about them that they might also believe. Would you note this? Healing is part of the atonement. All the way back in the book of Exodus, I will take sickness away from the midst of thee, for I am the Lord thy God that heals thee. The psalmist proclaims in 103 Psalm 2 and 3, O bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, forgiveth, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, and who healeth all thy diseases. Psalm 107, he sent the word and healed them. Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Malachi, he said, when the Son of Righteousness arise, he arises with healing in his wings. Matthew 8, 16 and 17, when evening would come, they brought unto him those that were demon-possessed. He cast out the demons and healed all that were sick, that he might fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Himself took our infirmities, and healed our diseases. Peter proclaims by his stripes we were healed. Healing is still possible today by the touch of God upon your heart and life. 
That was their expectation. They were casting their faith in Jesus Christ to bring that healing touch. But I want you to note something else, a sobering truth. That there will come a time when the promise of healing is overshadowed by another promise in the word of God where it says it is appointed unto man once to die. That is a sobering truth. It is one appointment that, my friends, you will not miss. It supersedes that healing touch at some point in time. I don't know when that will be. You don't know when that will be. But until that happens, both you and I have to believe God for that healing and delivering touch. We see also here in verse 11. It tells us that Jesus had full knowledge of Lazarus and his death. Fear not, my friend, this morning. God is fully aware of your plight. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're up against. He moves in your direction as Jesus began to make his way to where Mary and Martha and Lazarus were at. And he's moving in your direction today to help you if you let him. We see in verse 17 here, that Lazarus had been dead for four days. The community, the Bible tells us here, surrounded the sisters to bring comfort. That's kind of a picture of the church. I cannot tell you how many funerals I have preached in all my years of ministry. Without exception to those that were in the church, the church gathered around them in some fashion and in some capacity to encourage, to comfort, to pray for, to provide food maybe sometimes to those loved ones that had lost a loved one. They did everything they could to bring comfort. What a beautiful picture that is of the church. But I want you to see here, as soon as Jesus arrives, Martha makes her way to Jesus. You know why? Nobody comforts like Jesus. I've said many times that I've been faced with a sudden death in the church. And, and I've been called to minister to the loved ones left behind. And made them very aware of the fact that I'm without words. I, I, don't, I can't grasp anything that I can say that will bring the needed comfort at that moment in time. But God can. His word can. And... Martha understands this and she comes to Jesus because nobody can comfort like he can. And we all must move past people at some point. I appreciate people. I appreciate their kindnesses. But both you and I need something above and beyond that. We need Jesus. And then the glorious truth in verse 23, thy brother will rise again. Put your loved one's name there that maybe has passed on. A husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a loved one, a friend, a neighbor. Listen, to those that die in Christ, they will rise again. Paul said absent from this body means to be present with the Lord. But one day they're going to come back in the rapture. My friends... The dead in Christ are going to rise, and those that are alive and remain shall be caught up together. We will live again. So we don't have to sorrow. And we do not sorrow like the world sorrows as having no hope. We have hope. You have hope this morning. Set your eyes upon Jesus and let him fill you with that hope right now. The glorious truth we see in verse 25 and 26 is that Jesus is our resurrection in life as we believe in him. First of all, spiritually. When a man or woman comes to Christ dead and trespasses and sins, Jesus not only saves them and forgives them and cleanses them, he fills them with his life. He fills them with his spirit. We are spiritually resurrected. We've come alive to the things of God. And then, of course, one day physically, will be resurrected. If Jesus tarries and we die, we'll be resurrected and be brought back to life physically. 
Verse 28, Martha tells Mary that Jesus has called her. She needs to be comforted too. She needs to be ministered to. Mary quickly responds and places herself in a place where Jesus could help her. She, she finds herself at the feet of Jesus. You know what? We need to do exactly the same thing today. Get at the feet of Jesus. If there's no other place to find help and comfort, run to Jesus. Throw yourself at his feet. Allow Jesus to minister to you and to meet your need today. Both Mary and Martha make the same claim. If you'd only been here, verses 21 and 32. If you'd only been here, Jesus, Lazarus would not have died. When someone loses a loved one, there are always questions and wonderings and whys. I lost a good pastor friend of mine some time ago to COVID. I was just broken and shattered when I heard the news of our home missionary pastor, Danny Hess's passing at 60 years of age. I had a lot of questions, a lot of wonderings. And you can't go to people to get your answers. You gotta run to Jesus because only he can give you the insight and understanding that you need. And that's exactly what Martha and Mary needed. And let me tell you something, Jesus understands. He knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're going through. They journeyed to where he was laid, the Bible said. And we are given a glimpse of God's feelings at this time in that 35th verse. What is, what is, how does God view death? And how does God view those people, those loved ones standing around, heartbroken and, and shedding tears? Well, let's take a little bit of an insightful look on the heart of God. The Bible said in that 35th verse, Jesus wept. Now Jesus knew full well that just in a few moments he would be raising Lazarus from the dead. But Jesus entered in to their brokenness. He enters into your brokenness. And the Bible said Jesus wept. What a picture of sin and its consequences that breaks the heart of God and has from the day of Adam and Eve and still breaks the heart of God this morning. My friends, Jesus wept. He was moved with compassion towards these dear people. Verse 37 shows us the questionings of other onlookers. And Jesus has an answer for them. He welcomes honest inquiry. We know Jesus is and still is the answer. He's the resurrection. He's the life. He's the solution. He's the remedy. Whatever ails you, whatever your need is, God has the answer. And God will quickly come to your side and bring a divine illumination so you can understand before it's all said and done. There's nothing wrong with an honest question and inquiry. Let us come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. We see also here in verse 39, the command that the stone be rolled away. Wait a minute, Jesus. Don't you understand? That, that, haven't you been informed that Lazarus has been dead for four days? And he stinketh. They didn't embalm people like we do today and what have you. His, his body is already decaying. He stinketh. Humanly speaking, listen to me, he was beyond help. And I want to just stop there for just a second. How many spiritually do we know that we would say are beyond help? They're drunks. They're drug addicts. Their marriages are shattered. And on and on we describe the horrible plights of humanity. And too many times we say, they're beyond help. 
I want you to know something this morning without a shadow of a doubt. In God, nobody is beyond help. God can raise up a, 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 his hand and undertake and work the miraculous and meet the need if we'd only believe and trust him. And obviously here, opening this grave of a man that's been dead for four days required a real miracle. And we see in that 11th, or next in that 40th verse, believing brings us to a place where we can see God's glory as we see that word if there. If they can only believe, somehow step over the doubts, the fears, the wonderings. My friends, if you can only believe, all things are possible. If you and I just believe and take God at his word. In that 43rd verse, Jesus stands outside of Lazarus' grave. And I want you to note something that he uses Lazarus' name. If Jesus would have just said, come forth, all kinds of people in that vicinity would have been coming out of their graves. That will happen one day in the rapture. But he says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. This undeniable picture of the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. When Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, those that are dead in Christ, those that are alive in Christ, will be caught up together with him in the clouds, ever to be with the Lord. What a beautiful picture of the rapture that is. And what a day that's going to be. And then lastly, spiritual resurrections of those dead in trespasses and sins bring people into a place of believing that 45th verse. We shouldn't have to see somebody physically raised from the dead to believe. And friends, if you look around from a spiritual perspective, if you're in a church that preaches the gospel and people are getting saved, you're seeing spiritual resurrections on a regular basis. It ought to cause our faith to grow. It ought to cause joy to emanate and flow out of us to the glory and to the praise of God. As people are brought alive in God. As resurrected Lazarus became a living and undeniable witness of Christ. All the, the Pharisees and that, they hated Lazarus because he was a walking, talking testimony of the power of Christ. As Lazarus became this living and undeniable witness of Christ, saving power. The same should be said of you and I. The way we live, walk, talk, act, proclaiming ourselves to be born again, maybe spirit-filled believers, we ought to be a dynamic, glorious testimony of the resurrection power of a great Christ who resurrected us from our trespasses and sins who transformed our life and have made us living, walking, talking testimonies of the saving power of Jesus. If you've not been that way, please allow God to touch you this morning so you can become a living advertisement to the power of a great and mighty God. And if you this morning are dead in your trespasses and sin, similar to Lazarus who was physically dead, Jesus is standing outside of where you live this morning and saying to you, he calls your name, come forth. And he will save you and forgive you and impart to you eternal life today if you allow God to have his way. I can't make you do it, but I certainly invite you to open your heart and life and allow Jesus to save your soul today. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and your word. We thank you for your presence we have sensed and felt. We are praying that right now there are men and women, teenagers maybe, boys and girls that are bowing their head and recognizing their deadness 
and saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, save my soul. Jesus, bring me to life. Jesus, make me whole. And God, as surely as they cry out to you, you will save them. You will cleanse them. You will bring them to life. And I pray, Lord, that you will equip them and help them to live after you all the rest of the days of their life. And Father, for us as believers, if we've not really been the living, vibrant testimonies of your resurrection power in our heart and life, God, may we become that. May we allow you to have a more full uh, way in our hearts and lives. And God, may we be the best advertisements of your saving power that this world could ever come across. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll prepare us for the week ahead. Keep us in your safekeeping. Guide and direct our steps. And God, help us to be up and going about your work. Bless our efforts, Lord, and help us that in all things we would glorify you, we pray. We thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for gathering with us today. I pray I've touched and challenged your heart. Let's go out there and make a difference for Jesus. God bless you until I see you again. Amen.